I'm not a special individual. I'm just a college kid struggling to find his way in the world. I work as a dishwasher at a local restaurant, and for the most part, I enjoy my job. Sure, it's monotonous, and I have a tendency of getting in my own head during long shifts, but it pays decently, and I only work three to four days a week, so I don't complain. It was nine o'clock, and the restaurant had just closed. My co-workers, Ivan and Tom, had just finished up their closing duties around the kitchen, yet I still had a massive pile of dishes to get through. Well, shit, I mumbled to myself. Y'all good back here, Pete? Ivan asked me as he pulled his jacket over his shoulders. Yeah, man, I'm good. I should be done here by eleven, I responded. All right, sounds good. Make sure to lock up when you're all done. You working tomorrow? He said as he slowly started to open the back door. No, man, I work on Wednesday, though. I answered. Cool, cool. See you then, dude. Have a good night. Ivan waved a goodbye as he eventually walked out the door and disappeared into the dark streets of that cold February night. And just like that, I was alone. I didn't mind working alone much. After all, I had always been pretty shy, and I just figured that I worked better on my own terms anyway. I put my headphones on and started playing a true crime podcast to kill the time. This was probably not the best idea, seeing as how I was alone in a dark restaurant late at night. Yet, it was my routine, no different from any other night at work. I was about 45 minutes into the podcast when I sprayed down the final dish. I looked down at my apron and realized how filthy I was. When I did this, something caught my attention out of the corner of my eye. The garbage. Oh, come on. I exclaimed in frustration. How could I forget the fucking garbage? If you've ever been in my position before, you most likely know just how frustrating this feeling is. You're working a long shift, and right as you're about to leave, you realize you still have one more pain-in-the-ass task to get done before you can make your escape. However, it was just the garbage, and it typically didn't take longer than five or ten minutes. I sucked it up and walked over to the cart, which held the garbage from tonight's busy evening. Exploded sauce cups, dirty napkins, chicken bones, along with all the other delights that you can find in the garbage can of a popular restaurant, sat in front of me. All piled into the red dolly cart, which we used to transport the garbage to a dumpster in the back alley. Here we go. I huffed as I pulled the cart along. I pushed the door open, rounded the corner, and headed down the alley. When I arrived at the dumpster, the lid was already open, propped against the building behind it. Sweet. Less work for me. I picked up each garbage bag, tied the top, and heaved them into the large, green metal bin. One by one, I threw each garbage bag away, and then eventually picked up the cardboard so I could put it into the recycling. That's when it happened. There was a strong gust of wind. It was cold, and I sniffled as I pulled my mask up over my nose. Then, out of nowhere, a loud bang. I jumped out of my own skin, swiveled 180 degrees, and then felt extremely stupid. It was the lid of the dumpster which had once been propped open, but the wind had blown it down, causing the commotion. I was embarrassed, but no one was around to witness it, so I shrugged it off as I continued to stack up the cardboard. Then I noticed it. Approximately two feet wide and long, plastered onto the wall behind the dumpster. It was hidden behind the lid which had just fallen. A poster of some kind. It had a large skull printed onto it. Its mouth was agape, and it featured a green snake with red eyes slithering through the right eye socket and out the left eye socket. For reference, I live in the Pacific Northwest, birthplace of the Melvins, Mud Honey, and Nirvana. This place is the heart of grunge, so naturally I assumed that this poster was some kind of publicity for a local band. I was curious. After all, I'm always on the hunt for some new music, especially if it's hardcore. I walked over to the poster. I got a shiver up my spine just looking at it. It wasn't anything special. It wasn't the best illustration I'd ever seen, but it certainly wasn't bad. However, there was something eerie about it. Upon further inspection, I noticed a small line of text in the bottom left-hand corner. It read, 
and the Society of the Leviathan. That was it. I assumed it was the name of the band, and this was merely a poster for a self-titled album, since there was no text anywhere else on the poster. Cool, I thought. I walked back to the cart, pulled it inside, locked the door, put on my hoodie, clocked out, and walked back out to my car. Just like that, my day at work was over. I was giddy as I got into my car. I looked forward to lighting up a bowl of my favorite strain when I got home, making some top ramen, and climbing under my sheets. Ah, oh, yes, the college dream. Plus, I had the next day off. It was about to be a great night. I was extremely high at this point, approximately one in the morning. My girlfriend, Mackenzie, was having a night with her friends, so I was all alone that night. It was also at this point that I remembered the poster I had seen. Some music sounded nice, especially something new. So I was excited to search for the group on Spotify. Nothing popped up, however. iTunes, nothing. SoundCloud, no, not there either. Jesus, were these guys only on Bandcamp or something? Wrong again. I searched for this group for probably an hour before I got distracted by the Godzilla movie I was watching on TV. I was in that other state of mind, so I put my phone down, focused on the movie, and before I knew it, I was sound asleep. I woke up that Sunday morning feeling very groggy. I was having a severe case of afterbake, the equivalent of a hangover for a stoner. Nothing that I wasn't used to, though. I got up, looked at my phone, and realized it was dead. So I plugged it in, took a shower, and made some coffee. The perfect afterbake cure. I finally sat down, coffee in hand, picked up my phone, and began scrolling. I had a few missed texts. Uh, one was from my girlfriend, asking about my plans for the day, and another one from a number I didn't recognize. Uh, this wasn't that weird. I got random calls all the time and figured it was just another spammer. But then I read the text. Are you interested in joining the society? It asked. What the fuck? I said out loud, suddenly remembering my curiosity from the night before. I ignored the text. Hell, I cleared it so I didn't have to look at it. I figured that if I ignored it, then it would just go away. But then, almost immediately, I got another text. Don't hide from us. The new text read. I was terrified. It was like a deep web horror story, but this was real. I had to do something, so I texted back. I'm not hiding. I had stumbled upon your poster. I was just curious, I replied. Curiosity killed the cat. An immediate response said. At this point, I was shitting bricks. What was going on? Who was messing with me? I responded again by saying, Listen, man. I don't want to be any part of what you've got going on. Please, just leave me alone. Ten seconds passed. No text. Thirty seconds. No text. A minute. No fucking text. After a few hours passed, I tried to shrug this off as some freaky incident. I didn't tell anyone about it, though. If they found me that easily, surely they could find my girlfriend, my friends, or even my family. In fact, I hadn't touched my phone since the last text. I texted Mackenzie and told her I wasn't feeling good, trying to spark as little panic as I could. I let her know I was probably just going to stay home for the day. I told her that I loved her and that I'd be talking to her later. I figured that if I was going to be cooped up in my room all day, I might as well smoke some weed. My roommate Nathan doesn't like when I smoke in the apartment, so I always did my best to blow it cleanly out my bedroom window. My window looks out onto our balcony and faces another apartment complex. In fact, it's parallel to a window on the other apartment complex. The window it faces looks into a long hallway in the center of the complex, so I can essentially watch people enter their apartments. I replaced the water in my bong, packed a bowl, pulled the blinds up and opened the window. Time to relax. I pulled out my red lighter and went to town on the massive bowl I had just packed. And the next bowl. And the next. I was determined to wipe the memory from earlier that day out of my head. However, 
As I blew out my final hit, I looked across to the other apartment building, directly into the window. At the end of that hall was a man, standing probably six and a half feet tall. It looked like he was wearing a black robe with a hood over his head. This was terrifying as it was, but when I looked a little harder, I noticed his eyes. His eyes, they just shimmered, like ruby fucking red. It felt like they could look straight through me. Maybe it was the THC suddenly flooding my brain, but I couldn't look away. He just stood there. As I looked longer, I realized that he was holding something in his hand. I couldn't make it out at the time, but I could tell he was holding something. Despite being very inebriated, I was able to grab my phone and snap a quick photo. That's when she appeared. A woman and her young son soon stepped into my line of sight through the window. They must have come up the stairs. The door behind them closed as they turned down the hallway, straight towards him. My heart pounded. I thought it was going to burst out of my chest like that scene from Alien. Was I really about to watch this innocent woman and her son get shredded to pieces? I couldn't even do anything to stop it. However, the thought did occur to me to call the police. I was still holding my phone from when I took the picture. I unlocked the phone, opened the dial pad, and dialed 911. However, to my absolute surprise, the woman and child were fine. I held the phone in my hand, staring in disbelief as the two walked down the hall, inserted the key into the door, turned the knob, and calmly walked into their apartment. He was still there. How did they not see him? Was I really that high? I forced myself to look away. I closed the window and the blinds, made sure the doors were locked, and got into bed. I spent probably three hours just staring at the ceiling. I couldn't rationalize what I had seen. I'd never taken psychedelics, so I had no idea what it felt like to hallucinate. I'd heard of THC overdose symptoms, including hallucinations, so I tried to convince myself that that's what it was. But I knew it wasn't. I knew it. It was probably six o'clock when I started to doze off. It was early, but sleeping was the only thing I had any interest in at the time. I closed my eyes and drifted off. I woke up and it was dark out. Very dark. I looked at my phone and it told me it was now close to ten o'clock. I rolled over and cautiously put my index and middle finger between the blinds. I slowly pried the blinds open to see if he was still there. I was baffled. I couldn't see the window. It suddenly dawned on me that I couldn't even see the paneling on the building across the alley from me. Upon realizing what this meant, I backed away from the window. I eventually got the courage to pull the blinds up. I didn't have to. I already knew what was waiting for me on the other side of the window. I pulled that cord like ripping off a band-aid. Tears were already swelling in my eyes. The blinds shot up, and almost at once, I was shot back onto the floor. I yelled, grabbed my phone, and called the cops. I sat in the bathroom with the door locked until the cops came. Nathan had no idea what was going on, since he typically keeps to himself in his room on the opposite side of the place, but when he overheard me mention an intruder, he offered to give me a ride over to my girlfriend's apartment. Since he had decided to leave as well and go back home for a while until the police figured out what was going on. I'm not very close with Nathan, but even if I was, I'm pretty sure that car ride still would have been silent. He dropped me off, and my girlfriend greeted me at the door with a large, comforting hug. Hey babe, how are you doing? She asked me, arms entangling me. I didn't say anything back. Not because I didn't want to, I just couldn't. She looked me in the eyes and saw the pain I was in. And she didn't press me to talk. I appreciated that. Most of the night was silent as well. I'm pretty in tune with my emotional side, so I'm not afraid to admit that I spent the entirety of that night in her arms. However, once she fell asleep, I felt compelled to pull out my phone. I needed to see it again, to make sure it was real. There it was. The photo I had taken earlier that night was at the top of my camera roll. I could see him before I opened the photo. However... I opened it nonetheless, his blood-red eyes staring straight into the camera. 
I'm writing this the day after this all happened. I woke up next to my girlfriend this morning, thanking my lucky stars that I was still alive. I needed answers to this whole thing, so I went back to where the poster was. Key word in that sentence, was. Because it was no longer there. But where did it go? It couldn't have fallen down. It wasn't even peeling a little bit when I had last seen it. It looked like someone hung it up five minutes before I ran across it. I guess someone could have pulled it down, but uh, why? It was in a random alley behind a dumpster. I don't know, uh, I guess it's plausible, but I really wouldn't expect somebody to be upset about something like that. Like I said earlier, I live in the PNW. Uh, art is king around here, so it's not likely someone would have targeted this seemingly innocent piece of art. I'm really freaking out right now. I don't know what to do. If you haven't pieced it together already, the man I'd seen at the end of the hall was on my balcony last night, standing in front of my window. I don't know how we got up there. I live on the first floor, but it's still 15 feet off the fucking ground. How is that possible? While the mere sight of someone outside my window last night sent me into shock, it isn't what scared me the most. It's what he looked like. I don't even know if I can call him a he. The first thing I noticed when I saw him was what he had been holding. A knife. Almost looked like it was made of chrome. It was so clean. It was shaped like one of those ceremonial knives you find in Skyrim, curved and elegant, yet obviously very lethal. The hilt of the blade resembled the head of a snake, similar to the poster I had seen. The snake knife had those red eyes glowing faintly. That's what reminded me of the person's eyes. I panned up and made eye contact with the most unsettling thing I had ever seen. His eyes were extremely red, almost illuminating my windowsill, but the sockets they sat in were a mix between brown and green. There weren't any eyebrows, no hair, no nose, just two slits in the center of his face and an absurdly large mouth. His skin wasn't skin. It was scales. His scales were worn and torn. Some had fallen off or been plucked off, exposing a bright pink veiny flesh. The last thing I saw before running out of my bedroom was this creature's jaw, unhinged, revealing rows of jagged shark teeth, some of which looked like they had been broken off. And his tongue, his fucking tongue, it was narrow and long, forked like a snake. He ran his tongue over his jagged teeth, and his distorted face formed a smile. I hadn't seen anything suspicious today. I'm still staying with my girlfriend. The cops said they couldn't find anything proving that anyone had been outside my window. How is that possible? I feel like I'm going crazy. I'm not sure how this society works, but somehow they found me. I can only hope that they don't find you, too. But, forgive me. I need answers. If you've heard of the Society of the Leviathan, what are they? I know they warned me about being curious, but I need to know. <laughs>